So this session is a bit different from my last one. Uh, the last one was focused on sports technology from a uh, just kind of general you know, product standpoint. Uh, this one is focused on basically understanding bloggers, social media, uh, launching your product, uh, basically how to get a product into the marketplace and how to leverage uh, the online realm to do that. Um, so I'm a bit uniquely positioned to understand some of those areas. Um, and I'm going to talk about it not just from a blog standpoint of mine, but from the industry as a whole uh, and talk about how things are really tangled up in front of me here. Um, get this untangled, sorry. Otherwise, I'm probably going like, to fall off the stage or something bad. There we go. OK. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about, I'm going to skip the about the site part since we already did that in the first session. Uh, for those of you watching online, you can hit the pause button there and go ahead and see this whole thing later on. Um, but uh, the most important thing to understand when you're launching a product and you're dealing with the social media realm is that you must think global. Um, Social media is not local, uh, and I know it can be easy to fall into the trap of assuming that uh, because you're only going to sell to the U.S. or only going to sell to Canada or only going to sell within Europe um, that you can go ahead and do that. But these days, you can no longer think that way. Um, you have to think from a global standpoint because your products are competing on a global level. Uh, so you have to have a plan end to end for how you're going to launch your product across markets. That does not mean you have to sell your product tomorrow across different markets. But you need to think globally about it. You need to think about how you're going to get into those markets. Um, I've seen companies uh, like Epson, for example, that tries to launch their products in Japan. Like they have a, a Japan launch for their watches, and they pretend like the rest of the world doesn't exist. And they have a European launch, and then they have a US launch. The world doesn't work that way. Social media doesn't work that way. Like you can't sit there and say, OK, Twitter, please block out European followers for this week. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. That's not how media companies work. I promise you that the reason that Epson does not get media coverage in the US and in Europe is because those outlets look and say, you already released it in Japan four months ago. That's old news to us. Um, the fact that you want to release it now to the American audience, that, uh, who cares? Um, you have to think globally on this. Um, so who is social media? And I say who and not what, because social media is people. Um, it's not just a platform. It's not just Facebook or Twitter or anything like that. It's people behind all of these things. Every single tweet that you see and every single thing that you see on social media is, generally speaking, a human behind it um, writing that. And so it is bloggers, yes, as the, the title of the um, session is, but it's also YouTubers and Instagrammers and vloggers, which are different than bloggers or different than uh, YouTubers. Um, it's Twitters and it's BuzzFeed. Uh, it's your teammate on Facebook. That is social media. Those are all your target audiences as a company um, to hit. And so each one of these different people plays a different role in how you can get your message out. In addition, it talks that you have to look at you know who fits where into that realm. Um, so, for example, all those previous things I just listed there, every single one of those is likely in almost every single one of these categories here. Um, so, if you look at the top, you have sort of the aspirational things that all these all the companies in the world want to be part of. They want to have an article in the New York Times or the BBC or ESPN or CBS or Fox or one of these big media outlets. Um, but in a lot of cases, it makes more sense to be in mainstream sort magazines, right? To be in a runner's world or a bicycling magazine um, or a triathlete or men's health or something like that that's focused on your particular niche. Um, and then you have tech media, The Verge and Gadget and TechCrunch, Wired. Uh, there's plenty of others out there. And then there's blogs, uh, people like me and Cycling Tips and Bike Writer and Vila News and Lifestyle Blogs. Um, and then you have non-written social media, so Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat. Um, all those things are just as valuable as the ones up top. And in fact, a lot of cases, Things at the bottom here have more influence than things at the top here um, because they're hitting the right people. I've talked to numerous companies that said, oh, yeah, we had an article in one of these top ones here or mentioned one of those. And, yeah, it, it got a bunch of social media attention for a day or two, but it didn't actually convert to any sales for the product um, because they weren't targeting the right thing. They were just, you know, passer buyers. It's like driving past an accident. You're like, oh, wow, look at that. And then four seconds later, you're done with that. And it's the same thing when you look at these top things up there is that you're not necessarily targeting the right audience. Um, now, these can be useful in attracting attention down here if you do it right. And the same is true of the inverse. These down here can be in the useful in attracting the attention of people up top. Um, it, again, again, depends on what your target is. Um, and you got to talk about how you want to reach your target. Um, so is the New York Times or CNN really your target? Uh, and for a Garmin or Fitbit or an Under Armour, the answer probably is yes. For those companies, the New York Times or CNN or ABC is probably their valid target audience uh, for some portions of their product lineup. Um, at the same time, for Moxie or Quark or Kinomap, the answer is unequivocally no. Um, there's, there's almost no use uh, for having a Moxie um, write-up in the New York Times. And not saying anything bad for, for Roger, but from 
his standpoint, um, that might be useful temporarily, but it is not as useful as having 10 write-ups in one of the um, niche focused media that has you know, a huge following in that market. Um, that's something that uh, gets much more uh, conversion of sales than the other ones. Traditional advertising, as you probably know by now, is often far less um, effective than just putting product in people's hands. Um, you see this over and over again today where people are by and large ignoring traditional advertising, either by just simply blocking ads altogether, because that you can do that easily now on, in your browser and your phone and like that, um, but because they want to see real people's opinions. They don't want to see just an ad that shows something that's not very useful. They want to see someone that's tried something out. Um, I can guarantee you that if you took however much your ad budget is and just simply put it into sending out units into people's hands, uh, not just people like me, but lots of people that are going to post all of the internet about it, you're going to have a lot more success than uh, just doing one ad buy and, and crossing your fingers and hoping for the best. And the reason is, of course, online uh, and social awareness is more than global, uh, or is more than just a local ad. It's completely global. So something that someone writes uh, in the US will be read by someone in Brazil, and be read by someone in South Africa, and be read by someone in Australia. Uh, and it really is impressive to see my readership. And I talk about like, how global it is. And it's only about 45% now are US readers. Uh, the rest are global. Um, so that just kind of tells you, you know, even though companies may be targeting me from a US standpoint, the reality is readers are reading it everywhere in for years to come. So even though you may not launch your product today in the US, you may launch it in three months, or sorry, globally, you may launch it three months down the road, they're going to come back three months from now and read what I wrote about it um, on a US site, even though they're in Brazil or, or Chile or wherever else. So the first thing to understand is what is your goal um, within the social media realm. Uh, and there's a lot of different goals out there. Is your goal brand awareness? Is your goal launching a specific product? Is your goal getting major media coverage? Is your goal ambassadors? Is it grassroots efforts for smaller media outlets? Is it sponsored athletes? Is it simply product validation? Um, but be careful in the last one. Do not mistake product validation for awareness. Um, product validation is great for what it says, validating your product. Um, but a lot of times, if you try to merge those two together, they don't work. A lot of companies will go to sponsored athletes and say, um, we want you to validate our product, which is great. And then they'll say, we want you to be a sponsored athlete thing that you know, does social media stuff. And a lot of sponsored athletes actually suck at that. Um, and in fact, generally speaking, the higher up the food chain the sponsored athlete um, ladder you get, the less successful they are in getting your message out um, because they just they don't have time to understand that. Uh, and so it's something to keep in mind. Don't mistake the two. Um, is your goal measurable? Uh, and so you know, now that you've decided what your goal is, how do you measure that goal? And I think you know, too many companies go, in, go into this and just don't have a plan for what they're trying to get out of it. Um, if you're going to spend that time or money, whether it be cash or uh, product cost, um, how are you going to track the results of that? And I know this sounds obvious, um, but like if, if you go back to your, your companies um, and you start talking this kind of stuff, Everyone in that entire table should sit there and go, this is how we're going to track this, um, this spend. Uh, because otherwise, it's, it's probably going to be useless. So in the case of uh, bloggers, for example, you can ask most bloggers for stands, stats. Um, mainstream media won't do that, um, but I do that, for example. When, I, when a company gives me a product ahead of release, um, I almost always will send them, if I remember anyways. Um, I'm just staring here now at Jim, realizing I didn't send him any stats. Um, I almost always send companies stats on the 24 hours following that product launch on how many views that particular product got um, if they sent me something ahead of time. Um, and the reason I do that is that, one, it validates for them that I am valuable from a, a view standpoint. Um, but two, a lot of times it'll help them, the person you're contact um, there, to justify why you're sending out units ahead of time. And to be able to say, you know, after a like a, a typical Garmin launch, for example, uh, the day after, um, I'll send a note over, and usually it's like between 125,000 and 150,000 views for that post within that 24 hour period following a product launch. Um, and so that's something that's measurable that they can go back to. Um, and none of these companies are paying from, the, this, from me. This is something I just do because I think it's valuable to companies, and I think it's valuable um, for them to understand why it's, it's useful to have me have access to their product um, and talk about that product. Um, the one thing I don't like, though, is tracking links to company sites. So sometimes companies uh, send me links that are like tagged and it says, oh, this is from DCR when he sends it out. I slice that off instantly. Um, I'm just going to send it straight to the site. I'm going to send it to you know, whatever.com. Um, I'm not going to put a tracking link after that because to me, that's spammy. Um, it doesn't really track things very well because consumers a lot of times will read it on one influencer site and then eventually just type the URL into their browser and you didn't track that. So how do you, that doesn't convert very well. Very well. What does convert well though, if you're talking influencers, is coupon codes or affiliate codes or something where there is a there's a benefit to that blogger or to that um, site or that something 
something where they can say, hey, the consumer is getting a discount, so the consumer has a reason to use that um, code. The uh, site has a reason that you want them to use the code so they get credit for it, and the company can track that. Uh, and it's, it's very, very clear cut. Um, again, these things won't necessarily work for mainstream media, um, which is fine, they, they shouldn't, but um, they do work for bloggers. And again, the, the point of the presentation is to talk about all the different spectrum of, of social media out there um, being uh, both mainstream as well as we'll talk about pay to play in a second um, too. Make your pitch really clear. Um, so. You need to be able to explain your product uh, in 30 seconds to a non-believer. Uh, and I say a non-believer, meaning someone that does not understand your product at all. Your grandmother, your, your like, neighbor, someone like that. If you can't explain your product in 30 seconds to that person, it's, not, it's just like the coolness test I talked about in the previous presentation. Like if, if someone doesn't go, wow, that's cool, it's the same thing here. You have to be able to do that quickly. Um, and if you can't do that in 30 seconds, then what is the reason for that? And it, if it's something that's super industry specific, then maybe there's a valid reason for that. Maybe that's something that, um, you know, some aspects of uh, different sports technology is tough to explain to a random neighbor down the street. Um, but I think for the vast majority of people in this room, you should be able to explain that uh, pretty clearly. Um, Kino Map is a good example. Are they here in the room right now? No? Okay, good. So um, I'm going to use Kino Map as an example here. Um, and this is something I wrote a post up on yesterday. Uh, and I'm going to use lots of examples, by the way. This is just the first one. So um, you're not getting thrown under the bus. It's just you're along for the ride. Uh, so in this case, um, Kino Map did some really cool stuff yesterday. They announced some neat features. Um, but it, it was hard to explain what those features are. It's hard to, and it's, for me, I, I looked at that, and the presentation they gave me initially was actually relatively clear, um, but it's one of those things when I start writing about it, it's hard to sometimes make that clearer to a consumer. Um, so the, one of the things I would ask is, how do you, when you, if you as a company give a PR sheet to me, um, how concise is that? How straightforward and clear is that um, that I can then explain it to someone else? Like if you give it to me and give me 30 seconds to read through it, I should be able to then repeat the, that same concept to someone else and not get confused along the way. Um, the same thing you can do with your neighbor. If you give them that sheet and then they read through it and they say, okay, I got it, they should be able to explain that again to someone else. If they can't, then again, it's too complex. Something along the way doesn't make sense. And it could be because it's a niche thing, but it also could be that something isn't right in your delivery. Um, and why do Apple and Fitbit get so much coverage? Because it's simple. Um, if you look at their marketing messages, they are so perfectly simple. They are so perfectly concise. Um, and even Garmin isn't anywhere near as concise in their marketing and PR um, spins as these two companies are. Uh, they know exactly what they're focused on for every single launch, and it's crystal clear um, to the consumer. And what that means is crystal clear to the evening news broadcasters. So if you're looking for big mainstream stuff, you need to be able to explain something in 10 to 20 seconds, right? You need to be able to say, this is why this is interesting. This is why the new GoPro drone is cool or the new DJI drone is cool. And if you can't do that in 10 seconds or so, you've lost someone. Um, and that's how these companies can get mainstream media attention is they can get something that is very concise and very quickly messageable. Step three, are you going to pay to play? Um, now, I don't have a problem with the industry having pay to play. I have a problem with people not being clear about when they're paying to play. Um, so what is pay to play? Pay to play is basically where you, in some way, shape, or form as a company, are paying a media outlet, and I use media in a very broad sense here, um, to talk about their product. Uh, now, of course, if you're doing something in the US, if you're paying for product or paying that person, you have to disclose that via the FCC um, in some way, shape, or form. Uh, but you know, a lot of people don't do that. Uh, and so that's something to keep in mind. And pay to play can also be with uh, certainly mainstream publications as well. They'll simply say, we won't write a post on it until we have advertising spent, right? And something that um, you need as a company to decide whether or not that's right for you. Um, I would say there are cases where this makes sense. Uh, like if I look at the sports technology world, uh, GCN is a good example of a pay to play company that if I was a cycling company, I would, yeah, I would probably pay GCN for their, their, their time. I think um, from an advertising standpoint, their videos, um, what GCN does, Global Cycling Network, is basically they have a ton of YouTube videos every single day. It's half a million followers. Uh, and some of those YouTube videos are organic, meaning that they're not being paid for by someone else. Um, and some of them are uh, news things, again, not being paid for. Um, but some of them are things like unboxings and look at products that are paid for. And if you look down the sponsorship, uh, 458 lines down in the description field, you'll see that it says this was sponsored by so-and-so. Um, that is pay for play. That is simply paying for that video. Um, I think in the case of GCN, which I love GCN, I watch every single episode, um, but that's an example where you know, companies, could, or companies and sites be more clear that something was being paid for. Um, but you as a company decide whether or not you want to do that. I don't have a problem with that. Just 
be clear with yourself and your users as to what you're trying to do there. Um, the same goes for ambassador and athlete sponsorships. These can be very, very useful. Uh, I typically think ambassador sponsorships are more useful than athlete sponsorships. Um, unless you're talking something at the very top end where you're going to use this person um, on a lot of advertising material and stuff like that and be a big global brand, uh, I think you're much better off uh, going ahead with kind of that grassroots ambassador sponsorship and getting that into the hands of a lot of people versus the hands of one person. Um, you know, if you have to pay a crap ton of money for a, a big star, um, you can pay a lot of money for a lot of people in a lot of regions and a lot of different uh, target markets to get your message out. Approaching an influencer, so step four in this whole, this whole train here. Um, Again, are you targeting mainstream media or independent? Uh, totally different approaches. If you're targeting mainstream media, they're going to go through a different contact list. And if you're targeting an independent person like myself, because just me, um, do your homework on that individual. Understand what they normally talk about. I get about 100 pitches a week on average, uh, and I delete about 99 of them um, without even responding at all. I just delete, 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 um, because they're not paying attention to what I'm, I'm writing about. Um, and they're not, they're not doing something. Or they've copied and pasted. Like I hate, my biggest pet peeve is copy and paste. Um, I can spot a copy and paste email within a quarter of a second of seeing that, that window open up my email thing, and I just delete it. Like it's, it's so obvious. Um, the biggest thing is to be concise. It should be no more than a paragraph. It's to start off with my name on it. Um, if you don't have my name on it, then you've already failed because you don't even know who you're talking to. Um, all that kind of stuff. It's, it sounds basic, but again, if you're talking to an influencer, if you're talking to someone who is supposedly you know, popular right in that segment, they're getting a crap ton of mail. They're getting a crap ton of information being shot at them by a lot of people. Um, you have one paragraph, and one paragraph only to explain what you want to do. Do not try to explain your entire product in one paragraph. Just, just simply say, we're doing something really cool. Here's what roughly we're doing. Let's chat some more. Um, do not paste a press release in there, another pet peeve of mine. Um, so just keep it clean and simple, and then continue the conversation somewhere else. Uh, and then don't hit me up on Facebook and Twitter um, as a product pitch or a like that kind of thing. Um, a lot of people despise that. Uh, and the reason is because when you do that to me, I know you've done it to someone else. So the first thing I do when you um, say, hey, we've got a new product, you know, if you go at DCMarigo.blog um, on Twitter, hey, we've got a new product, check us out. I look at your pro Twitter profile and I see that you've just hit up another 200 people on Twitter for that same thing, um, which means that I'm not special, right? Because you didn't take time to send an email to me. You just copied and pasted this 140 character thing on Twitter over and over and over again to every single popular person out there hoping someone would bite. Um, and everyone else sees that through. Unless you're, unless you're a small site that's desperate for attention there, you're going to see right through that and ignore that same stuff. Next, define the relationship. Um, now, for traditional mainstream media and people like me, you don't get to define the relationship for the most part. Um, you're along for the ride. Um, but if you're talking general influencers where you're paying for that, um, that coverage or that influence or whatever it may be, um, then you do get to define that relationship. And you should have something that you're getting out of it. Um, so what is your, your catch up or meeting cadence with that influencer? Are you meeting with them you know, once a week would be probably excessive, but once a month, once a quarter, once a whatever? So they're up to date in your products. And so they're up to date on talking about it. Um, what metrics are you getting from that person? Uh, again, if you're not getting metrics, I'd argue you're not getting anything out of the relationship at all. Um, what's in it for the influencer? I mean, that's obviously why they're there. For some influencers, it's simply just getting a free something or other. That's it. That's all they care about, right? They're just they're happy to promote it, or you can get just ten percent off your stuff. That's cool too. Those are all people that are incredibly valuable um, to get the, the message out and the word out. And then, you know, I'd rather spend money for, as like I said before. Uh, a whole bunch of people than one person. Um, there are exceptions, of course. So one is Casey Neistat, a well-known YouTuber, has five million YouTube um, people out there uh, that follow him, uh, subscribers. And he's something where people send him stuff constantly, all the time. Uh, and if you get on his show and on his, uh, his daily vlog on that, um, you can make it big. And you can get incredible popularity. And it can be on any topic, be from a GoPro to a bag. Um, and a, and a good example of that is, GoPro had them uh, borrow their Karma drone uh, back a few weeks ago. That, that video had 2 million views um, within a day and a half, which is more than GoPro's own videos. Um, DJI did the same thing. But so did a single guy from Alaska that sent him a skateboard bag. Um, so uh, Casey has the boosted board, which is electronic skateboard, and he travels a lot with it, um, and he hates his bag. And so this one guy from Alaska, the one-man shop, made a simply like a travel bag for him. And he sent it to him, just simply said, I'm a one-man shop. 
here, this might help your life. It might make your life better. That's just enjoy. Um, and this guy got like half of a vlog featured on him. Now keep in mind, every single one of Casey's vlogs gets a minimum million, if not two million views within a day, right? And so this guy, just by setting product there and saying, this might make your life better, um, worked out. It wasn't a huge pitch. It wasn't something where it was over the top. It was just, here you go, see if this makes your life better. So understand again what you're, you're trying to do. Now there's three different ways to launch a product. Um, so kind of shifting a little bit away from influencers and talking about product launches for a little bit. Um, in, you know, when you get, in terms of getting news coverage, obviously the, how you make a product is your problem, but how you get it into the, the media realm, um, I'm gonna talk about here. Uh, first method one is getting product into people's hands ahead of time. Um, so that's something where you know, you've gotten ahead of announcement, ahead of, this is all before announcement in method one here. Um, so in this case, you've seen your product a few weeks in advance or a few days in advance or months in advance, that's method one. Number two is briefings on products ahead of time. So this is where you cannot send someone the product because you just don't have enough of them yet. Um, and you wanna do briefings in person or whatever the case is, that's another way that the media outlet then has data and or has um, photos and text and all that kind of stuff for their, your launch day there. And then method three is launch event uh, day announcements. Um, now, a lot of people may look at something like an Apple event or Samsung event and stuff like that and think it falls under this. Um, and that's true if you're on the bottom of the, the, the totem pole. Um, but the higher up in media realm you go, if you talk in New York Times, for example, or CNN or The Verge, all that kind of stuff, they're getting this kind of stuff up here for these same events that the general public sees down here. Um, and it's important to understand that you can use all three of these things combined depending on who you're targeting for different media outlets. You know, you can't have everyone at a sideshow event. You can't send product to everyone in the world. Um, but you can find a gradient that makes sense for your product in your particular market niche. Um, so do you have a couple examples? I love examples. They're lots of fun. Um, and examples, as I said before, are not meant to throw people under the bus. Um, it's a learning experience. We're all going to learn from this. So uh, example in the last 10 days, uh, or 12 days, something like that, um, GoPro announced a new Karma drone. I'm sure everyone in the room has heard about it. Uh, DJI, the other big uh, competitor announcer, um, or competitive drone company, announced their DJI Mavic drone. Um, both of these companies, so you don't know anything about drones at all at this point. You just have to know they are drone companies. They took pretty different approaches to how they announced their product, and the result got very different. Um, kind of receptions to the product. Uh, the first one is GoPro held an event down in Squaw Valley. Uh, they invited a handful of media, a pile of sponsored athletes, and then a handful of investors to this event, um, set up fancy tents in Squaw Valley. Uh, they had media run through basically 10 to 15 minute flights in the unit, very brief, very, very brief hands-on time and a structured schedule. And the structured schedule is really important to understand because it goes to how media works. They started off with a 9 a.m. Um, basically product announcement presentation that was live streamed around the world. The media were in the room for that. None of the media there had access to the product before the 9 a.m. session. So you're sitting there as a media person watching the session, typing as fast as you can, trying to get this ready to go. So as soon as that session's over, um, you can publish something. But the catch was that they then had to go out for um, basically all their hands-on time outside immediately after that. So now you've done, you've basically stalled media coverage for the day because people are going, well, I'm not gonna write something right now. I'm gonna wait till later in the day to do it because I wanna have all this extra content in there. So in effect, GoPro actually stalled coverage for the entire day because they didn't just do that in reverse, right? If you just simply give the hands-on time ahead of time and then do the announcement, it makes a lot more sense, um, which is exactly what DJI did. Um, so DJI seated units in people's hands uh, up to a month in advance. Um, they then held a big event in New York City. They invited all these popular vloggers to it, um, and like 100 people in this event, and they had tons and tons and tons of coverage. The distributors had units out there, um, and so within 24 hours, you had videos and hands-on time from around the world in all different channels um, because they did that correctly. Uh, and this is, you know, GoPro for, will certainly do well in the market because they're GoPro and you, know, you can walk into Best Buy and you're going to see a GoPro unit there and you're going to buy a GoPro drone. Um, but this is a perfect example of how having units in people's hands got way more attention uh, than having a small pile of units that people could touch for a few minutes on a schedule that didn't work well. Um, another example of a well-executed launch was actually Garmin's Verb Ultra 30 this past summer. Um, in fact, I would say this is actually the Garmin's best product launch they've ever done um, from a PR media standpoint. Uh, and so what they did is they started seeding action cams back this summer um, as early as uh, two to six weeks. I had mine back in uh, late uh, July for what was a September 1st, I think, announcement. Um, but different outlets had it uh, you know, in varying time frames within that. Um, and it wasn't just tech outlets like me. It was big mainstream outlets across the board, mainstream newspapers, 
orders, all that kind of stuff, had units ahead of time, and they had it during the summer, um, which again makes sense because it's an action camera. Uh, if you give someone an action camera in like November, I promise you you're gonna have the most boring footage on earth because the leaves are all gone, so you see brown footage. People aren't skiing yet, they're not at the beach yet, you just have crap. Um, so this is something where they nailed this because people are doing cool stuff. So I had like a bunch of cool trips all summer long. Here's me and Ibiza there. I like beautiful pictures on turquoise water and so did everyone else because they're all in summer vacation. Like this is a well-timed launch where they had units ahead of time. And most importantly, on the day of the launch, people could buy product that same day on Amazon immediately, um, which is huge. You wanna be able to buy product right away. You don't wanna lose a consumer and say, oh, I'm gonna buy it another week later um, because that doesn't work well, as I'll talk about again in GoPro in a second. But you don't have to be big budget, right? So that, that takes money. Here is a simple low budget exercise uh, that Polar did with their M600 launch. Um, they did this past summer as well, back in August, I think it was. Um, so they seeded out units to just a handful of people, like five people, I think, as far as I know, uh, worldwide that had these units um, about two, three weeks ahead of time. Uh, again, very small group, um, some mainstream media type folks and, and me, just not, not too big, um, but they got wide coverage, partly due to the product, but partly because they knew how to target the right groups of people. In this case, it was an Android Wear watch, so they knew how to target that particular audience, um, and they got a really, a really solid uptick from it. Um, and the only downside for them, though, is they did not have near-term product availability, uh, but they did have the ability to buy the product right away. You just couldn't get it right away. Um, so again, Low budget here, just send out some products to the right people. It's all about finding the right people in your niche. So, sidebar media events. Talk about this briefly. This is the SRAM uh, Cork media event from back in the year like, uh, August, I guess, late August. Um, these can be the most successful way to get media coverage if they are executed correctly. Um, and the first thing to understand is do not waste your time with marketing rah-rah for these events. Um, I promise you, media hates marketing rah-rah. Uh, we will not wear your cycling kit. We will not need to do all that stuff. We don't want to. We want to wear our own kits because that's, that. well, first off, from an optics standpoint, it, it looks bad if I'm wearing like a polar kit and seeing the polar picture later on. It just doesn't work. Um, so don't do that kind of stuff. Just give journalists hands-on time with product. Just go for a ride, just go for a run, go for something. Uh, but time these events ahead of major events. So in the case of uh, SRAM and Cork's events, it was in the two days prior to uh, Eurobike. It was even great because they offered two different options. You could do a Monday or a Tuesday, um, which is awesome because that way it's flexible for schedules. Um, it was just timed really, really well. Uh, and you know, time it again ahead of Interbike, a sea otter, your bike, uh, whatever your event is, time it to that event in the days beforehand. Um, again, this is if you can't do something where you're seeding products elsewhere um, or ahead of time. This is just if you want to do something tied to the major event, this tends to work very, very well. The one tip though is do not do same day embargoes. I promise you press hate this more than anything else. Um, so if you do this awesome event and you say, okay, you can go live at 4 p.m. today. I, I promise you the press in there will be secretly swearing at you left right down the middle because the entire time they're sitting there thinking about, okay, do I ride longer? Do I use the product longer? Do I, I gotta go back to my room? I gotta write this up. I gotta edit photos. I got all this stuff. And you're gonna get crap coverage. Give it a few days. I think in the core case, it was two days. I think uh, in other cases, it's been a week. Um, a week is ideal. Um, but yeah, just a few days is, is more than enough for people just to take a breather, think about the product, get all the shots they want, uh, and then announce it um, or then be able to publish data. Um, so just in case you're not familiar with how product sidebars work in general, here's kind of a quick overview for them. Uh, keep them small. Uh, most successful product uh, launches uh, where you just come off the side are you know, between 10 and 20 um, media major outlets uh, in total in your niche. You're going to choose like half of those. You're going to choose the best of your best for your particular niche and get them somewhere. Um, you can either do that through you know, putting them at your own office, so you can bring them to your offices, you can bring them to a second location, or you can bring your product team to their offices, right? All three of those are valid ways of doing this. Uh, the key of that you're, there, though, is you're getting uh, your product people in front of the media people, whoever they are. Um, that way they can talk back and forth and get good information about that. Um, now, some of this stuff is more applicable to technical products and is non-technical products, but um, I think this is whole true, whether it's a GoPro or an Apple Watch or anything like that, um, it's all about getting people in front of engineers and folks that understand the product. Um, Typically, a cadence of a sports tech launch, this kind of way these all kind of work, again, is that you've got a power paper presentation, you usually spend that for like an hour or two, um, then you're gonna go outside and spend some time with the product, you usually can go for a ride or a run, whatever the case is. You usually analyze and download that data as a group or some sort of you know, individual uh, company plus PR or company plus sorry, uh, media person um, side by side. And then after that, you got the launch uh, a couple days later. Um, don't overthink this. Don't make this too complex. Don't worry about like fancy food and all that kind of stuff. 
most journalists don't want that. They just want the product, they want it quick and simple, they want time, and they want to go back to their hotel and write stuff. Um, again, simple is better here. Understanding trade shows, last couple slides. Uh, you know, the, kind of my rule of thumb is if I find out about your product on the trade show floor, you have failed. Um, I can't reiterate this enough. Um, for any mainstream media outlet, um, they should not find out about your product by walking by your booth. Um, that is a massive fail because by the time that happens, it's too late. Like they've already got their stuff lined up for the week. This is true of CES or Interbike or Eurobike or anything out there. Um, when I go to those shows, I'm going there to catch up with people and to go there to find these tiny little unknown things out there that I didn't have time for beforehand. I'm not going there to cover major products. That's something I've already done ahead of time. All my, like for Eurobike, my cutoff this past year for Eurobike was the Friday beforehand. Um, if a product was not in my hands by noon on that Friday, it likely wasn't going to get covered at Eurobike. I may have had like a passing um, post on it or something like that, but that was my cutoff time for being able to get good detailed coverage on it because otherwise, by the time I get to Eurobike, I'm walking all day long from 7 a.m. till who knows how late at night with meetings. And to get good posts out and get good content out is tough. Uh, if you look at like bikerumor.com, for example, they're still putting out posts from Eurobike and Interbike right now, and that was almost a month ago, which is fine. There's no problem with that, but that just shows you how much content is there, um, and most of their content is caught on the show floor. So there's a lot of potential to do that beforehand, uh, and you know, one to three weeks is ideal for most of these um, products and companies. Okay, some final thoughts on social media. Um, as I said before, metrics, metrics, metrics. Um, that can come in a variety of different things. That's typically, though, views, likes, and shares. Um, those are probably the most important things that I look at across the board. Uh, conversion rate, if you're talking sales down the road, that's fine, too, if you have a way to track that, like coupon codes. But um, if you're giving something to an influencer, have a way to look and understand how many views did that post get, how many shares did it get on Facebook, how many likes did it get on different platforms? Um, those are the things that matter. Um, but also do understand that different people target different audiences, uh, meaning that I have a YouTube audience. I think it's about 30,000 people. That's not that big, though, in the grand scheme of the YouTube world. For me, it's the written medium that's bigger, right? So my written medium is going to attract the same number of people as someone that's a YouTube star. So understand your influencer what their medium is. Don't, don't judge them on YouTube stats if they're a blogger, and don't judge a, you know, a Snapchatter on Instagram stats. They're, they're totally different things. Make sure you're focused on what you're doing there. The time is the enemy of the media. Um, so before, during, and after your product launch, always be cognizant of time. Make sure that you're giving them time to get their job done, um, because that's what they need more than anything else. They need time, and they need answers back, and that goes to timeliness. And so if they have to wait on something, they're likely to skip it in their post or their, their article. Uh, so make sure they get that as quick as possible. Give them your cell phone number or something like that. So if they have to get something, they have it instantly. Um, Video is growing massively. Like I've seen that, you've seen all my recent posts. I have videos for everything. Even my post this morning, I have a video of me managing to do a flip on the mountain bike over here last night. Um, video is super popular today, but don't overthink it. I see too many companies spending too much money on video production um, for something that gets like 12 views on YouTube. Um, it's just not worth it. Like literally, take out your phone or take out a cheap camera and record it as is, right? And just stick it on YouTube and go with it. And, and again, don't overthink that stuff. I think video production has its purpose and has a great purpose in a lot of cases, but do not burn so much of your, your budget on making this perfect video on something that is watched by a couple hundred people on YouTube. I, I know like your heart collectively sinks when you see that. Just use your cell phone. People want data, they want simplicity, they want easy stuff to consume. Um, two last things. One is just look or look carefully at uh, follower stats. I mentioned this earlier on you know talking about the difference between if a YouTuber versus an Instagram or something like that. But also look carefully at the number of people followed versus following. Um, especially useful on Twitter. Uh, if you see something like a lot of lifestyle bloggers, for example, they're like, oh, I have 150,000 followers on Twitter. Yes, but how many people do you follow? You follow 50,000 people. Really. What does your timeline look like? How do you, how do you even consume 50,000 people for this stuff? Right? To me, that's fake followers. That's someone that's not a real influencer. That's simply fake. Right? So you want that ratio to be as high as possible. You want basically where um, you have a super high number of followers and a super low following, um, which isn't to say like you want like three following people. Right? That person is only um, following pe three people. But you want it to be a massive spread between the two of them. If they're following, again, 50,000 people, 
that's something wrong with that, that account. That account to me screams that there's automated bots there and they're basically upping their numbers uh, to look and gather um, you know, attention that's, that's not real. Last but not least, just like I said in the last presentation, um, just make cool shit. Media will always follow cool shit. If you've got stuff that people go, dang, that's super cool, I guarantee you'll get media attention all day long. Um, again, it goes back to pitching it, though. You have to be able to sell and explain why that's super cool. Explain the use case. Explain why that is neat. Um, and that is something that, you know, it's super, super important. Going back to my earlier example of Kinomap, um, you know, they have a lot of technology there in what they were announcing yesterday. But it was this one or two things there that when it popped, when you said, holy crap, I can go and look up any of my past Strava segments for the past three years and see videos on that, that is flipping cool. That's what I'm going to talk about. And that's the pitch that, um, in their case, that they would have wanted to make um, across the board is how do you do that kind of stuff? How do you separate all of your entire message of all the, the technical stuff rattling around your head from nine, 10, you know, 12 months of product development into what is the coolest possible thing in the shortest amount of time? And that's what will get the most attention. So with that, thank you very much. And I'm, uh, if any questions first, I think we can do a little bit of Q&A if you have anything. Otherwise, thank you.